Once again, Trump didn't bother to show up for the most recent Republican Party primary debate. But honestly, I kind of get it if I put myself into his headspace. Not that that's possible, but I can try. I mean, why should he bother when he's still polling, not even just higher than all of the Republican candidates on Wednesday night's debate stage, but also higher than Biden at the moment as well? The Hill says that the former president holds an enormous lead in the polls. In the national polling average maintained by data site 538, Trump leads the second place to DeSantis by 43 points. Even in Iowa, a state that Trump lost in 2016 and where his rivals think he is most vulnerable, he has a 28-point lead. By avoiding the debates, Trump removes the risk that any of his rivals can land a serious blow on him, and there is the added advantage that they tend to squabble with each other. When I tell you all that this is going to be the most important election of our lives so far, I am not being hyperbolic. I'm serious. Democracy has never been more at stake. I hope, as we all do, that Trump isn't able to actually take part in this election and make a play for the presidency. And if he stopped from doing so, we need to be aware of who the next contenders are. Hi, I'm Andy, and my pronouns are they, them. Welcome to Assigned Christian at Birth. Our Friday show is always about theology, pop culture, or politics, and our podcast on Sundays, Morning Thoughts, is all about my personal experience in the evangelical fundamentalist bubble, as well as my journey out of Christianity, and all of the things that I am currently learning as a New Testament scholar. On today's show, I'm going to be doing a quick and dirty recap of the third Republican presidential primary debate that happened in Florida this past Wednesday night. If you missed the last two, I have recaps on my politics playlist, and I encourage you to go watch those as well. I'll link those for you at the end of the video. The main theme of this week's debate was foreign policy, which does make sense considering the recent violence in the Middle East, as well as the continual war in Ukraine and the fentanyl coming into the United States from China via Mexico. Chris Christie. If I had to pick one of these candidates to vote for, it would be Christy. Not saying I want to vote for him, but after sitting through three of these debates, I am confident in saying, I, I know it's a low bar, but he has consistently been the most reasonable candidate who has the strongest footing in reality. I'm not saying I like him or that I want him to be president or that all of his positions are good ones. And I would never vote for a Republican candidate. Let's just be clear on that. I only wish that the majority of the Republican Party was living in the real world enough to give a chance to a moderate candidate. He's anti-abortion but pro-states' rights and respects what the people of each state vote for in regards to abortion. Again, I know that's a very low bar, but that's what we're currently working with when it comes to the new GOP, many of whom are convinced that states like California, Illinois, and New York are just doing abortions on demand via drive through while other candidates, like Ramaswamy, are calling the Jewish-Ukrainian President Zelensky a Nazi, make that make sense, and suggesting we just let Russia have the territories in Ukraine that they are currently occupying, Christie very reasonably and astutely called our country's history up for reflection. When the moderators asked how long the United States should be expected to help fund the Ukraine war, Christie reminded everyone that the last time we turned our back on a war in Europe, Hitler rose to power and we were only able to buy ourselves a few years. He also reminded everyone that in 1992, the United States promised Ukraine if they returned their nuclear missiles to Russia that we would protect them. Christie said we need to keep our promises and added that those of us who forget history are doomed to repeat it. Let's talk about Scott. This guy wins the most outspoken evangelical award for this debate. He quoted several Bible verses throughout the night and from his opening statement to his closing statement, he pushed extremely evangelical Christian beliefs from what reads as a dominionist angle. His first first words on the stage were, the truth of my life destroys the lies of the radical left. We are working on a foundation based on faith. The loss of faith in this nation is part of the erosion we're seeing. Restoring Christian values will help this nation become the city on a hill again, like Reagan said from Matthew 5. Lincoln talked about a house being divided in Mark. America doesn't work without Judeo-Christian values. I'll be the president to restore faith in God. Okay, for those of you who've been here a while, you've heard me rant about about how the phrase Judeo-Christian is not a thing. There's Judaism and there's Christianity. Christianity appropriated Judaism and tacked their new religion onto it, but it is not the same religion in any way, shape, or form. Scott ended the debate with saying, there's a cultural and spiritual crisis in our country. We need another great awakening. We need to reject the left's valueless, faithless, fatherless society. Wow. <laughs> Turn back to faith and patriotism. Stop kneeling in protest and start kneeling in prayer. 
I don't know why he had to like slam on Kaepernick this late in the game. I don't know why he thinks that's going to win him. He ended by saying, if you're able-bodied, you work. If you take out a loan, you pay it back. If you commit a violent crime, you go to jail. If God made you a man, you play sports against men. There was like literally no transphobia in this debate. There were no questions about anything to do with trans rights. But this guy just had to go ahead and shove that in there for no freaking reason other than to prove he's the most Christian candidate. Honestly, I'm really glad this guy does not have a chance of winning and I'm not going to bother saying anything more about him because hopefully he gracefully bows out and realizes that he does not have enough support to be in the next debate. Fingers crossed I don't have to listen to this guy talk again on stage. Okay, now we'll cover the three who will most likely be showing up again to the next month's debate on December 6th in Alabama. I'm going to spend the least amount of time on Ramaswamy because I personally think he's a joke and I don't want to waste time on him. We all know he's not going to win, especially after this debate, which was his worst performance and kind of caused everybody to see what I saw from the first one, that he's just an enormous freaking troll. His opening statement didn't address the moderator's question at all. Instead, he attacked the moderators and insisted that Tucker Carlson, Joe Rogan, and Elon Musk Musk should have been the moderators instead. He said things like, this is about you, the corrupt media establishment. Were you the ones who pushed the Trump-Russia hoax or was it Hillary Clinton who paid you? I've already thought Ramaswamy was a joke based on the last two debates where he literally has continued to chant, drill, frack, burn coal. He did that again on Wednesday night, of course, too. Then he went on to actually claim that the 2016 and 2020 elections were stolen. I feel like if anyone is still shilling these false claims on a debate stage in 2023, they shouldn't be allowed there. In a fact-checking article on USA Today, the text reads, a mountain of evidence, including lawsuits, recounts, forensic audits, and even partisan reviews affirmed the results of the 2020 election. The November 3rd election was the most secure in American history. The Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency and its partners said in a November 2020 statement, there is no evidence that any voting system deleted or lost votes, changed votes, or was in any way compromised. Okay. Nikki Haley. The Hill.com named Haley as the winner of this debate, and I guess if I'm just assessing this as a debate and not like the highest stakes for our democracy, yeah, sure, okay, she won this debate. She was attacked a lot, but none of the barbs really stuck, and she called Ramaswamy scum on stage, so I guess she gets one point from me on that one. The Washington Post poll also agrees that Haley was the winner. They say that a poll of potential Republican primary and caucus voters who watched Wednesday's debate hosted by NBC News finds that a plurality or 34% of debate watchers say Haley performed best. No other candidate on the stage came close to Haley. DeSantis was a distant second with 23% and Ramaswamy made a relatively negative impression with 29% of debate watchers saying he performed the worst. I think the lean toward foreign policy in this third debate really helped Haley a lot since she's a former U.S an ambassador and has a lot of experience with foreign relations and foreign policy. There was a lot of back and forth between her and DeSantis about China, but in the end, she really hammered it home that we need to have Ukraine's back because Taiwan knows this sends a message to China, that we need to be tough on China and stop selling to them and formal trade relations with them until they stop murdering Americans with fentanyl that's in quotes. She's really into the idea of modernizing our military through cybersecurity, AI, and space programs. She also stood out for me on the abortion issue too. Again, yes, the abortion bar is low for Republicans, but like Christy, Haley is willing to accept whatever each state decides, even if she doesn't personally agree with it. So, That actually sounds reasonable when compared to what people like Scott want, which is a 15-week limit federally. Okay, let's talk about Florida's own boy, DeSantis. DeSantis is also way more into border security between the United States and Mexico than he is in Ukraine. But of course, he's into defending Israel because he's a Christian. He said if he could speak to Netanyahu, he would tell him, finish the job once and for all with these butchers in Hamas who want to wipe every Jew off the globe. We will stand with Israel in public and private. He also talked a lot about having served in Iraq. He brought up, you know, having been in the armed forces in every single one of the debates, being a veteran. Um, Lots of criticism on Biden for what's happening in Iran right now. And he really emphasized that the war in Ukraine needs to come to an end and have the Europeans step up and do their fair share. Regarding DeSantis, the Hill said he did not have any single transformative moment on Wednesday, but that it was his best debate performance so far. (laughs) 
<laughs> so he had no transformative moment, but it was his best debate. Like, oh, scrape in the bottom of the barrel. They ended by saying it wasn't a game changer, but it was good enough for the Florida governor in his home state. Not exactly inspiring, is it? Okay, so what should we be looking for in the next debate in December? Will Scott gracefully bow out or will he force us to listen to his Dominionist tirades for another two hours? Will Haley win another debate in the polls? And is there even a shot of a woman becoming president in the 2024 election? Will any of the candidates actually have concrete answers about what they can do in the short term to fix the current inflation issue? Will more people actually watch that debate? Last night's debate had dismal viewership, and part of me wonders if that's because the majority of them are really dialed in for Trump or have no desire to educate themselves or learn about any other options, or whether it's like political fatigue or something. The Washington Post reported only just over a quarter of Republican primary and caucus voters reported watching Wednesday night's debate. Honestly, I don't really blame them. It was really hard to watch, but I spent the majority of my life completely ignorant about politics due to the way I was raised and then continued to keep my head in the sand for many years because at that point I was privileged enough to think that politics contributed nothing either way to my survival. Truly, it was until things looked like they were getting dire before the 2016 election that I became politically engaged. And now, unfortunately, I can't look away, even though sometimes I really want to. If Trump isn't able to run, we're going to have one of these people running in his place. And it's important to know exactly what we could be in for so that we aren't caught off guard the way we were when Trump won his first election. It just sucks that the best the left can wish for is that Biden will be reelected and that things will remain the same shitty status quo of the moment in hopes that we can actually get our shit together and find a truly viable candidate for 2028. And it sucks that things are even more contentious now than they've ever been in the last two presidential election cycles. On this Sunday's upcoming episode of Morning Thoughts, I'm going to be discussing what the American Values Survey 2023 says about the potential for political violence tied to next year's election. So please be sure to come back for that. If you'd like to support me, please give this video a like. Please give me a follow. Share my stuff with your friends. I truly appreciate it. If you'd like to support me monetarily, I do take donations at buymeacoffee.com slash assigned X-T-I-A-N. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Okay, bye!